At the end of the video, I'm going to tell you how half a century after his death, Bruce Lee is helping the oldest continuing culture in the world to retain its culture and language. But let's get on with the show. Hi and welcome to the channel. If you haven't been here before, the title says it all. I talk about movies. So let's get started. This time around, I'm looking in detail at the four disc set that Umbrella Entertainment have put out under their Films of Fury label. And they are the four big Bruce Lee movies apart from Enter the Dragon. And so we've got a four disc set here. Cool movies, but... I slipped up a bit last time. There are actually five movies on this. And I'll talk about that when I get to the fifth movie. But uh, that one's got features of interest and cringy bits as well. So let's start with the first of them. The Big Boss from 1971. Now The Big Boss in America was known as Fists of Fury. Which caused some confusion when the second movie came out. But it's a little gem. And it's cost $100,000 for Golden Harvest, Raymond Chow's company to make, and it made $10 million at the box office, so they were quite pleased with that. In this one, Bruce Lee plays a guy called Cheng Chao Ong, who moves from the New Territories in Hong Kong to Thailand to work with members of his extended clan in an ice house. There's good money to be made working in the ice house there. They can send money back to the family, and a whole bunch of emigrant Chinese workers work at this ice factory and like Way of the Dragon this movie is about a guy who's a fish out of water he doesn't understand the local culture he's a bit clueless but he does have mad martial arts skills which is always a big plus the thing with Cheng is that he's made a vow of non-violence he's promised his family he would be non-violent they gave him a jade amulet to signify that he will be non-violent and even though he does have incredible kung fu skills he's not allowing himself to express them even when other people are being bullied by thugs on the streets of the town in thailand where he's working he's holding it back and for the first half of the film you've got bruce lee holding it all in so you get a natural ramping of tension now there are a few problems at this ice plant the big boss who ultimately runs it lives in a, a great big mansion full of guard dogs and kung fu warriors and um, a son who thinks he's the best fighter in the world and also the ice house itself is a front for a drug smuggling operation the bags of heroin are hidden in ice blocks and transported to where they need to be people start disappearing mysteriously one of Cheng's uncles who was supposedly going back to China didn't arrive there and so he's disappeared and a couple of his family who also work at the plant disappear after finding out that things aren't exactly the way they should be at the ice plant. Bruce Lee had some problems on this film. He kind of had disagreements with the director Lo Wei on how the film should be shot. He ended up choreographing all of his own fight scenes and there's a discernible difference between the martial arts fights that Lo Wei directed and the ones Bruce Lee himself choreographed. It's not only a qualitative difference, there's also always with Bruce Lee's self-choreographed fight scenes, there's a story there, there's an arc and an escalation, there's strategic thinking going on. And that's very much not apparent in the scenes that Lo Wei directs. And Bruce Lee had disagreements with him when his character throws a guy through the wall of a shed and there's a human shaped outline on it. Bruce Lee didn't want to do it that way. He wanted just to have the guy crash through the shed. But Lo Wei had a very kind of low sense of humor, no pun intended. And he wanted to shoot it with the uh, kind of cut out of the guy's shape and him punching through it. And that's the way it was shot. And there were some changes made when the movie did get released in Western markets. The music, as I said last time, the original music um, for the film was by Joseph Koo. It's a pretty good soundtrack, and it's very much culturally appropriate soundtrack. But for, soundtrack, not soundtracked. 
And for the American version, they got the German composer, Peter Thomas, whose work I like a lot. I like his Jerry Cotton soundtracks. I like the stuff he did for the German science fiction TV, Rom Patrol, in uh, the 1960s. Very distinctive sound, lots of brass in a Peter Thomas soundtrack. It's a good, it's a good soundtrack, but it's not quite right for this particular movie. But uh, ultimately, Bruce Lee's character, Chow, works his way up through the gang. He starts out by um, going through the lower rung thugs who work at the ice plant and who are the overseers there. He then escalates to the son of the big boss, and then he goes to the big boss's house and ultimately has a boss battle with the big boss, which is possibly where the term boss battle comes from. But the lovely thing about this is you can see the start of, well, not necessarily the start, but the start of these four movies where Bruce Lee is really changing the way that wuxia and martial arts cinematography is done this bruce lee's fights always have a story they always have he has to do this and that these obstacles are placed before him he has to change what he is doing to overcome those obstacles and ultimately prevail and which indeed is what he does in this movie and the interesting thing is there are two different endings to this film as well and the nice thing about the umbrella entertainment discs are they give you the alternate titles and they give you the alternate endings to each of the movies. So you can kind of mix and match and judge for yourself which you prefer. And I like that. It's, it's a good extra to have too because you don't actually have to watch too much. You just have to watch a few minutes of the titles and go, yeah, I like the one that came with the movie itself or I like the one that did things a little bit differently that was for certain Asian markets or I like the one they did for American markets. You can very much mix and match, and I, I really appreciate that. It's a, a good addition to make, and it shows you the choices that are made in post-production on these films. There's also a feature documentary on this one, Bruce Lee, The Man and the Legend. But to get back to the big boss itself, the big boss battle has two different endings, one of which is cut shorter than the other. And I like the longer ending in this one. The lovely thing about Bruce Lee's battles in most of his movies, in fact, all the movies of his where he starred, is that there are emotional consequences for victory. His characters are never triumphant when they uh, beat the bad guy. They're kind of worn out, they're sad, they, they kind of realise that usually they've taken a life and they've done horrible things in order to protect the innocent and to prevail. And you can definitely see the consequences and the and the weight of that on the character. And I love that in Bruce Lee movies. I love the fact that violence isn't glorified. Ultimately, it's a means to enact justice. And that makes a hell of a difference. And I really like it in this. There are also some nice touches in this film earlier. Where you see Bruce Lee's gift for comedy. And usually, in fact always... The comedy you see in the movies Bruce Lee made, particularly these four, is self-depreciating comedy. The, his character is the butt of the jokes. And it's something that Jackie Chan carried on for a lot of his career as well. Jackie Chan's character is usually the butt of the jokes in a Jackie Chan straight-up action film. And Bruce Lee kind of carried that over from a certain kind of Chinese cinema and introduced it to Western audiences where the guy is an incredible martial artist. He's a God-level fighter. But in social circumstances, he can be awkward. He doesn't understand the culture in some of the places he's in. And, you know, makes goofy mistakes, particularly when it comes to girls. So I like the fact that you've got that, well, you could probably call it yin and yang. You've got the goof and the buffoon, and you've got the God-level fighter. Both in the same person, the two aspects of the same character. Uh, the things he does best and the things he does very, very badly. Bruce Lee, as an actor, was willing to make himself the butt of the joke. And that's something that you don't see often enough in cinema, particularly with people who are the stars of action movies. You're never going to see Tom Cruise be the butt of a joke in a 
Mission Impossible film. And uh, I think they like the Thai settings as well. I, I think it's good to have those different locations in the, the film because it's, it's kind of like the, the um, Shaw Brothers movies as well. You see pretty much the same landscapes and locations because they filmed them on the Shaw Brothers back lot with the Shaw Brothers Wisha movies. But this one goes out of this way to, to give us a different location. It also has a little bit of nudity in it, which surprised me because I've forgotten it had nudity in it. And it's got some scenes set in brothels that were filmed in actual Thai brothels with the sex workers as extras in the movie. They were making more money being extras in the movie than actually doing their night job or day job or whatever you call it. And so they, they kind of enjoyed, in a sense, a holiday from their day jobs. But uh, leaving that aside, Big Boss is a good start to this series of movies. And it's the one you should start watching first for the simple reason that there is a progression on the kind of, not necessarily the learning curve, but the way in which Bruce Lee is empowered in his movies to make them the way he wants to. And also in the way he films them and the way that his characters and their struggle is shown on the screen. So that's the first one. That then brings us to Fist of Fury. 1972, uh, produced by Robert Chow, directed again by Lo Wei. This is the last film that Bruce Lee starred in for Lo Wei. And it's actually the only Bruce Lee movie of this era it's a period piece. It's set in 1910 in Shanghai. And Bruce Lee plays a character called Chen, who returns to the Kung Fu school where he was trained to see his Sifu, his um, master, and arrives just in time for his master's funeral. His master has supposedly died of a stomach flu, but as the film progresses, we find out that that's not the case. And he has been poisoned by a rival martial arts school, a Japanese martial arts school, because they want to prevail in the martial arts world in Shanghai, arranged for the teacher's death. This is based on a real life incident in Shanghai, which was quite well known in Chinese martial arts circles, which happened just a little bit earlier in history. But there's some aspects of it that Bruce Lee wasn't happy with when he was making the film. There's very much an anti-Japanese sentiment in the movie. And there's some overt racism about Japanese people in the film, which Bruce Lee, who had Japanese friends, of course, because the martial arts world in America, where Bruce Lee spent a lot of his time, were very open to other cultures. There, was, there wasn't the, and the cultural xenophobia that he found in Hong Kong. So he, he had a lot of arguments with Lo Wei. In fact, he went at Lo Wei at one stage, who hid behind his wife, who hid behind Lo Wei's own wife, so that Bruce Lee couldn't get to him. But leaving that aside, the movie is good. Bruce Lee's character in this one is an angry and damaged man. He, he really does suffer a lot that his master is dead. His emotions are sticking out of him like spikes. The martial arts school set up by Sifu was set up for peaceful reasons. Martial arts was used as exercise and health and for mental balance. It wasn't used as, as violence. And yet, Chen, the character played by Bruce Lee, is all too ready to use it for that reason, and so loses his path from his original teachings. The other members of the school try to keep control of him. They, um, they kind of try to talk him down and calm him down. He goes underground after beating up some people at the Japanese martial arts school and starts hiding in Shanghai. The police are looking for him. He's um, hiding in a graveyard eating roasted rabbit on a stick. And he is disguising himself in various ways to infiltrate and learn about what actually happened to his master, listening in on what the other martial arts school is doing and what they plan to do to destroy Chen's Sifu's martial arts school. And this, of course, is the movie where you get to see Bruce Lee using nunchucks for the first time on the big screen. And that is where things leveled up. Everybody I know who watched these Kung Fu movies at the time was sawing off broomsticks and threading through bits of rope through them and making homemade nunchucks. I'm sure there are a million concussions caused by this movie. 
I know my friend made a set and we all tried them out and all of us ended up with bruises but it was still a lot of fun to make them and in fact the UK when it was showing Bruce Lee movies for a long time will cut out any of the bits with nunchucks in them because it encouraged young people to make them and use them so they were a forbidden weapon and uh, British censorship did knock them down for a bit and this is also where you get a lot more of the kind of cat-like yowling that Bruce Lee did which was just kind of iconic and is actually on the soundtrack of Enter the Dragon along with Lalo Schifrin's music. Uh, there's a scene where he tries to go into a park and there's a sign saying no dogs or Chinese allowed and he takes care of that sign pretty well and his character Chen is basically a serial killer. He finds out who in his martial arts school poisoned his ma martial arts master and he kills them and hangs them up from a lamppost. Now, there's a scene in this one which is very controversial and kind of confusing to Western audiences. He goes in and visits the people working in the kitchen and notices that one of them is Japanese by looking at him. And white people think that he's looking at the guy's nipples and somehow telling them that the guy is Japanese based on his nipples. But that's not the case. He's actually wearing a thing called a hakimaki, which is a Japanese male girdle that's worn underneath clothing. And Chinese people didn't wear that. So what Lee was actually looking at is the guy's girdle, this kind of elasticized girdle that he has around his waist, which tells Chen that the guy is actually a Japanese infiltrator into the martial arts school. So I had to do a bit of Googling to research that, but that's actually the case. So if you watch Fist of Fury and you're confused by the bad guy's nipples, that's what would happen. There's also one of Bruce Lee's students in it, a guy called Robert Baker playing a character called Petrov who is a Russian um, martial artist. And he's quite good too, he's a big guy, he, he's bulky, he moves well, he, he knows his martial arts. And he's the one of the parts of the boss battle that Chen ultimately has to deal with. And he's quite good in this one. He's got a, a weird look about him, he looks like he's wearing eye makeup, maybe he is, maybe he isn't, I don't know. But he kind of wears a suit with a bow tie and braces and in the sense watching the, the battle between them it is very much a battle of eastern culture versus western culture in a strange way there is a lot of that xenophobia in fist of fury which played well to a chinese audience and maybe didn't play well elsewhere and i think also bruce lee was pretty smart and then he knew you he wanted to the movie needed to sell to japanese markets to do that they needed to cut out the racism you also get some kind of interesting secondary characters in this one as well. The Chinese interpreter for the Japanese martial arts school is played by an actor called Wang Pi Ao, who specialised in playing ratty, slimy little characters. Uh, he turns up again in Way of the Dragon as well. But in this one, he's playing a kind of cowardly interpreter. So he was a character actor playing a, a particular stereotype. And he does it quite well. There's also Nora Miao turns up as a love interest for um, Chow, the Bruce Lee character. She turned up briefly in The Big Boss as well as a seller of soft drinks on the side of the road in, in Thailand. But uh, she's good value in there as well. She kind of humanizes the character played by Bruce Lee by showing his, the softer side of his character. When, for the most part, where he's basically like Paul Kersey from Death Wish. And without the, that kind of leavening of tenderness, it's, it's like Milton the monster. You know, without a drop of tenderness, the monster might destroy me. And that's a deep cut, Milton the monster from a Bruce Lee movie. But um, you can definitely see from Fist of Fury, the influence Bruce Lee had on other people who came just after him in this kind of film. You can definitely see the influence of Lee's character in Fist of Fury on characters like Sarugi from the Street Fighter series. So Sonny Chiba was very influenced by Bruce Lee in this. Sonny Chiba had a career for a decade and a half before what, uh, Fist of Fury came out, but when he started doing those kind of martial arts roles like Sarugi and Wolf Guy and the other ones he did in the 1970s, there was definitely that influence on the kind of feral cat-like ferocity of Bruce Lee on Sonny Chiba's later career. 
The back blurb on this one says, the most dangerous film ever. I would say Triumph of the Will was, but you know we can agree to disagree. Special features on this one, a feature documentary, Bruce Lee, The Legend. Interview with Yuan Wa, interview with John Natsumura, who played one of the characters, Nora Miao, who played the love interest, and Riki Hashimoto, who plays one of the other Japanese fighters there. Again, you get alternative openings and alternative endings. It's really interesting to see that for those of us who are fans of what happens after a movie is actually shot. So the post-production stuff. There's a stills gallery and trailers. I enjoyed this one even more than I enjoyed The Big Boss because you could start to see that fight choreography of Bruce Lee's intensifying that strain of telling a story and seeing him need to change tactics and change how he handles different antagonists and that intelligence really made it different than a lot of other films and in fact the last movie I'm going to talk about Game of Death 2 demonstrates that more than anything else that I can really tell you about but uh Fist of Fury, second film. Way of the Dragon. This one I love for so many reasons, mostly because it was written and directed by Bruce Lee himself. Bruce Lee bought about 16 books on filmmaking to improve the way he made this film. It was filmed in Hong Kong and also on location in Rome. And it is probably the peak Bruce Lee solo action film. End of the Dragons, more a three guys on a mission kind of film with Bruce Lee as one of the three focuses of it. But for me, this is where Bruce Lee peaked as an individual action star. He plays a kind of, uh, again, a rural bumpkin from the New Territories who works on a farm and is sent by his family to help out a restaurateur who has inherited a restaurant in Rome, played again by Nora Mial who is being hassled by local thugs. It's never really understood why they particularly want this Chinese restaurant, but they do. We get Wang Piao again playing a very camp interpreter for the, um, let's just call them the mafia. And there are a bunch of people working in the restaurant who are um, kind of trying to teach each other karate and then learn martial arts from Bruce Lee's character who is called Tong Lung. And uh, one of them is called Unicorn Chen, which I think is a really great name. It's the second best name I've actually seen on a human being. After my great, 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 great grandfather, whose name was Hercules Jenkins. Um, Unicorn Chen is a great name. But the movie starts with Tong Lung turning up at the airport. He, the plane gets in a bit early, so he's looking for a meal. And he's a fish out of water. He doesn't speak Italian, doesn't speak English. And he's hungry, he want, he, so he goes into a restaurant and orders things off the menu. Ends up with seven different soups because he can't read the menu. He doesn't read English, doesn't read um, Roman script. So he, he kind of eats, eats those soups and ends up with a stomach upset and spends the first you know, half to an hour of the film with digestive upsets. And again, that's Bruce Lee making his character the butt of the jokes. And he knew what kind of comedy um, Asian audiences liked at the time. And so that's definitely a part of that. Some of that was cut out for some of the American, European and Australian prints. But I think it works well. Some parts of that on this particular disc are a little bit low resolution. So they may have been sourced from um, maybe a VHS copy or, or something like that. Which is a bit of a shame. But once you get past that, everything looks crisp and wonderful. So he goes to the restaurant and Nora Miao's character thinks he's a hick in a bumpkin. She lets him use the spare room in her apartment and he kind of wins her over over time by basically being the decent human being he is, even though he is totally useless and totally clueless when moving through Western society. And of course, this, like the big boss, is a reflection of the Asian immigrant experience in other countries, in Thailand in the first case, in Europe in the second case, and it's something with which Bruce Lee and his family were very familiar. So in the same way, a lot of modern films are now talking about the Asian immigrant experience in America and, and Australia and in England as well. Bruce Lee was ahead of the curve on this. He wasn't doing it in an overt way, but there's subtle 
um, recognition of those difficulties and, and the way that people can be misperceived because of their lack of knowledge of a particular cultural, cultural milieu. That really makes it an interesting film before anybody gets hit in the face. And I think that was the direction Bruce Lee's career may have gone in the future. I think that there was that possibility of a kind of deeper Bruce Lee filmography in the future had he not died of a cerebral edema at the age of 32. And no, I don't believe that anybody killed him with a dim Mac death touch. That's just bullshit. There's also some really interesting things where the Mafia's got guns and Tong Lung's got to find a way around the gun, so he ends up making darts out of chopsticks and using them to skewer the bad guy's hands before they can shoot their guns off. So there's that kind of recognition of the different ways in which violence is enacted, enacted by the two different cultures, which is kind of cool, at the behest of the slimy little uh, interpreter. Three martial artists are sent for to take out Tong Lung. One of them is Robert Wall, one of them is Chuck Norris. And that's where the movie escalates into something we hadn't seen before in cinema. And that is a brutal martial arts fight that really shows us the kind of protean nature of what Bruce Lee was doing with martial arts cinema. The fight with the first two martial artists, one of whom was played by Robert Wall, uh, take place outside and then and then Tong Lung follows the, the slimy little interpreter into the Roman Colosseum. And there's some nice location shooting in and around the Colosseum as he tries to find where Chuck Norris's character Colt is while he's being taunted by the interpreter whose voice echoes around the arena. And then, of course, they cut to studio scenes for the actual fight itself. Um, like the real Colosseum, there are cats on the studio floor, so you see the cats almost reacting to what's happening in the fight scenes, which is kind of a nice circuit breaker for each phase of the fight. But that is one of the best martial arts fights around. And that increased brutality of the fight is something that Bruce Lee may have got from American films. Films like Dark of the Sun with Rod Taylor and also uh, Darker Than Amber with Rod Taylor and The Wild Bunch and things like that. Bruce Lee knew you could go more violent and more brutal in movies. And that boss battle between him and Chuck Norris. Now, Chuck Norris could never act. Anybody who says differently is kidding themselves. He was a good martial artist, but acting wasn't his thing. Uh, he was good at reacting in this movie. I think he and Bruce Lee had such a good rapport that Bruce Lee's direction brought the best of Chuck Norris to this, which is even without dialogue, his character reacting to... The different phases of their fight is really interesting and there's a nice change in how Bruce Lee handles things as well because he starts out with standard kung fu and that kind of doesn't work it's not getting him to defeat the enemy cult and so he changes to Bruce Lee's own style of martial arts Ji Kundo and he starts thinking strategically he takes out one of Colt's arms and one of his legs. He knows that this guy is more physically powerful than him. He's just as fast as he is. So he needs to find an advantage because um, Tong Lung is smaller and shorter than his enemy. So he's got to find a way to negate that advantage. And that again is that strategic thinking in martial arts that Bruce Lee really made something special in cinema. And I love that fight scene. And I've never had time for Chuck Norris in any of his starring roles. But I like he and Bruce Lee fighting in this one. It is one of the truly great martial arts fights in cinema. And again, this is one of those points where his character suffers for his success. He takes no pleasure in victory. He survived it and he is worn out by it and he is shattered by it because the violence is never without consequence in a Bruce Lee action film. And I love that. I love the fact that it doesn't just go back to him being the cheerful hick that he was at the start of the film. 
uh, there's there's consequences to violence and consequences to killing human beings. And I think that part of Bruce Lee's philosophy is that there are those consequences and that they should be shown in action cinema. And respect to the guy for that. So that's the third of the four movies. Bruce Lee started a fourth movie and then went off to make Enter the Dragon because there was a bigger paycheck for it. He was going to come back and finish this film. It was... A good concept that Bruce Lee had, which was to have his character travel up levels of a, of a pagoda, fighting different martial artists at each level of the pagoda, uh, not knowing what he's going to hit next, and kind of dealing with whatever there is. And the idea was, I think there were seven levels, so they were going to be the equivalent of the seven deadly sins. So that concept was great. Here's the problem. They only got 11 minutes and 7 seconds of usable footage of that particular fight, which Bruce Lee uh, had filmed with Robert Klaus, the director. Script was written by Robert Klaus and Bruce Lee. Robert Klaus used the pseudonym for his part of it. And then Bruce Lee went off and made Enter the Dragon, and he was in Hong Kong. Uh, took the wrong medication, died of a cerebral edema. Cut to... That was 1973. Cut to 1978. And Warner Brothers... Frankenstein together. Game of Death. This is a horrible movie in any objective way. But there's 11 minutes and 7 seconds of it that isn't horrible. They did everything they could to act like Bruce Lee was in more of this film. They had body doubles. They had his character appearing in shadows. They even had a cut out of his face, pasted it over a mirror so it looked vaguely like the guy who was the body double was actually Bruce Lee. From a modern viewpoint, this movie is cringingly bad. It's got some reasonable actors in it. Dean Jagger, who won an Academy Award for 12 O'Clock High. It's got Hugh O'Brien in it as well. It's got Gig Young in his last film role before, unfortunately, he... Uh, was the instigator of a murder-suicide with his 31-year-old wife. Uh, Gig Young was a tragic figure in, in cinema, and uh, which is not to say that anything he did was justified. But um, watching most of this movie, which includes scenes of Bruce Lee's funeral, including his open coffin, which for me is unforgivable. Um, I'm not a fan of open coffins anyway, and I am never going to go to an open coffin again I find it uh, much too harrowing for me but yeah this movie disrespected Bruce Lee in so many ways that it's um, a difficult watch <clears throat> I'm not even going to go into the plot of it I'm going to talk about the 11 minutes and 7 seconds of sheer martial arts brilliance that's in this movie and that is two boss battles First one between Bruce Lee and Danny and Asanto. He starts out using a screamer sticks and Bruce Lee uses a kind of whippy cane stick. And then it escalates to a nunchuck battle between the two of them. And that is great. And again, this is the peak of Bruce Lee's strategic martial arts choreography. His character has to find a way around the advantages that the other character has. He has to think on his feet literally and find a way to defeat the guy who is bringing unexpected things to the game. Uh, of course, he's wearing the, the um, yellow tracksuit with the black stripe, which has now become iconic and was in Kill Bill as well, in the scene where the bride kills the crazy 88. And if you watch this movie, the tracksuit on the body double leading up to that scene, which is near the end of the film, is not the same color as the one Bruce Lee wears. It's a different kind of yellow. But leaving that aside, the battle with Danny and Asanto is fantastic. The choreography is great. The wide shots are where wide shots need to be. The medium shots are shot really crisply. The close-ups for the reaction shots are perfect. It really is a nice combination of those three, each using their own purpose. The purpose of the wide shots being to see where people are in relation to each other and how they're moving. The medium shots are for the contact. The close-ups are for the reaction. And it really is um, fantastic to see that Robert Klaus and Bruce Lee working together to make that really function. 
Then you get the, which could be arguably an equal to the Chuck Norris boss battle, which is when Bruce Lee's character in Game of Death meets Hakim, played by Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, who was a student of Bruce Lee's in martial arts. And it is one of the most uneven-looking fights ever. Kareem Abdul-Jabbar is about half a human being taller than Bruce Lee or was, you know, was, you know what I mean. His arms and legs were incredibly long. He had leverage advantages because of that in the fight. And he's just the size of his hands and all of those kinds of things gave him advantages over the other fighter. And there are times when it looks like they use force perspective to enhance the difference between two characters, but they didn't. Kareem Abdul-Jabbar was that bigger than Bruce Lee. And watching the two of them fight together and watching, you know, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, who's fighting barefoot, slams his foot into Bruce Lee's chest and there's an enormous footprint on the front of his tracksuit shirt. That's the stuff movie magic is made of. It's an incredible fight scene. And again, you've got that strategic thinking. How do you defeat a character who is just as fast as you, has a much longer reach, much stronger, and much taller than you? And Bruce Lee brings it to there and uses the environment, which is pretty much a fairly bare room with a staircase going up in the middle of it. That 11 minutes and 7 seconds of those two fights is incredible stuff. The rest of it is cringingly bad shit. Now there's additional features on this, which is the second Game of Death movie, which I find kind of interesting. Butchered and Frankenstein together out of body doubles and um, reaction shots from earlier Bruce Lee movies and all the other bits and pieces they put together for it was crazy popular in certain markets. South Korea and Japan particularly loved it like Vegemite. But, which is an Australian saying that not everybody agrees with. But, so they decided to make Game of Death 2. And they used some Bruce Lee Frankenstein together footage, but then they killed off the character that supposedly was played by Bruce Lee in Game of Death, a guy called Billy Lowe, and brought in his brother so they could use another actor without going to all the subterfuge and pretending that it's Bruce Lee. And he goes on a rampage against bad guys. There's some really weird bad guy scenes. There's a fake lion in a darkened room that's really wild. There's a mountain with trained peacocks that's flowed down out of the mountain into a paddock. There's a kind of James Bond set for the bad guy boss battle at the end. And the actor playing Bruce Lee's character's brother who was never really played by Bruce Lee at all, shows the difference between ordinary wusher action and Bruce Lee's wusher action. Because the martial arts fights at the end of Game of Death 2 are terrific. They're athletic, they're energetic, they're comic, they're almost like parkour crossed with martial arts in a fun way. But two things. First off, the impacts aren't really impactful. Secondly, the guy never gets tired. I'm doing too many fingers. Secondly, the guy never gets tired. Thirdly, they're not strategic. They, they really don't... They're a good demonstration of the difference between old school wuxia, which is more about the spectacle and the athleticism and the acrobatics of the fights than the goal of the fights, the emotional content. You remember when Bruce Lee was talking about emotional content in End of the Dragon? emotional content and um, the ultimate goal and the consequences of violence. None of that you get at the end of Game of Death 2 but it's a crazy off the wall gonzo second half of that movie which is worth seeing. It's crazy mad shit. Now a lot of it was filmed in Japan. There's some interesting street scenes where he's walking around a red light district and there's really shallow depth of field around the character playing Bruce Lee's character's brother, who wasn't really played by Bruce Lee. Reason is that they filmed it in Japan and they didn't want to have the street signs showing up Japanese characters instead of, in, uh, instead of Chinese characters because it was supposedly taking place in China, though a lot of the film was filmed in Japan. The reason I know it was filmed in Japan is there's a scene where he walks into a kind of like a playboy nightclub kind of place and right next to it is a movie poster 
for a Torasa movie, Otokawa Sorayo was one of the longest film was the longest film series in the world, where the same actor played the same character. It was a comedy movie series in Japan. They got one of the posters for that, what right next to the entrance of the nightclub. I did a whole video about Torasan and the Otokawa Sorayo movie series, which I'll post a link to in the notes at the end of the video. But that's why I know it was filmed in, in somewhere in Tokyo, probably, rather than in Hong Kong. So, yeah, um, I'm still sorely disappointed with the fact that this movie was ever made. But I'm really impressed with the 11 minutes and 7 seconds of it that contain state-of-the-art Bruce Lee. Now, I said I was going to talk about Bruce Lee 50 years after his death. is helping to... It's helping one of the oldest continuing cultures in the world retain culture and retain language. Because this little gem, Fist of Fury, was released last year at the Perth Australia Film Festival, dubbed into Noongar, one of the Aboriginal languages of Western Australia around Kalibari. <laughs> And it was a passion project because a whole bunch of indigenous people around Australia love Bruce Lee movies. They saw them in drive-ins in places like Calibari in Western Australia in the 1970s. In the 1980s and 1990s, Jackie Chan took that role. And I know up in Wilcannia in Western New South Wales, the Wilcannia mob loved Jackie Chan movies. They couldn't get enough of them. The kids would sit around and watch them endlessly. And that came from their love of Bruce Lee because for indigenous kids in a very disenfranchised culture, particularly in the 1970s, they were seeing a movie where a non-white guy was winning and a non-white guy was prevailing against white guys. So as this part of this passion project, there is a, a version of Fist of Fury that's been released in Noongar to help the local people who love Bruce Lee movies retain their language and culture. And I love that. I want to see more of that kind of thing. I think that that weird cross-pollination between a guy who lived in America, travelled to Hong Kong, made Hong Kong films, travelled back to America to make a film, you know, back and forth, had a big influence on a totally different continent, on a whole bunch of people, and is now, 50 years after his death, helping them retain their language and culture. Uh, that's the kind of Australia I want to live in where those things are done. And on that note, I'm going to let you know as well, the Conservatives lost the election on Saturday here in Australia. And we've got a, a Labor government now which is doing all sorts of good things. They've only been going for three days and they've already done a number of things that are changing the culture in Australia for the better. The Conservatives got the shit beaten out of them in the election. They lost a ton of seats. They lost a lot of their politicians. And there's a lot more representation of diversity, both racial and um, sexual and other areas, in the Australian Parliament now. And it's been a good few days for people who want this country to be better. And then, of course, I'm, I'm reviewing this movie and I realise that there's the Noongar version that all rolled into that zeitgeist. And yeah, I'm quite happy with this. I'm optimistic for the future of my country, which I wasn't a week ago. So on that very positive and optimistic note, thank you very much for watching. And thank you again to Umbrella Entertainment for giving me the uh, last two of those Bruce Lee movies. Uh, it was a fun reviewing them. It was fun learning more about them too from the extras. If you enjoyed the video, please consider liking and subscribing, leaving a comment and giving me a thumbs up. You can also support the channel by throwing me a few dollars every month at patreon.com slash paleocinema. I will be putting up more review, written reviews for the Patreon supporters soon. And anyway, look after yourselves. If you live in a country where things are going bad for people in need, and you live in a democratic country, 
do what you can to change it. it it makes an enormous difference and it makes an enormous difference quickly so on that note watch some good movies watch some bad movies in spite of its flaws watch game of death and i'll catch you next time Thank you.